Hi everyone! Today I am here to do my May wrap up. I know at the end of April that I said that I was kind of not feeling wrap ups anymore and didn't really want to do them because I wasn't really sure if the format was for me, but I have since changed my mind. And yes, I agree that wrap ups are not the most effective way to talk about a big series of books if you read 18 things in a month like I did in April, which was bananas. But when you read a more reasonable amount like I did in May, I think the wrap up works just fine. So um, I'm going to go back to the format for now because I love watching wrap ups so much. And I think that seeing all the May wrap ups kind of spring up reminded me of that fact. And also not to get too meta in like the analysis of the wrap up as a form, but I do want to say that I think there's something really nice about having some distance from books before I speak about them um, and not just talking off the cuff about what my initial responses were because I did try to do a May vlog and it was really long and quite boring and I was basically just recording immediately after finishing books. I personally feel like I need a little bit of space and a little bit of time to really fully synthesize my thoughts and come to conclusions about what I've read. So I really like the distance that doing a monthly wrap up or even a bi-monthly wrap up provides me in, in being able to think about what I've read more more fully. So that's all to say that the wrap ups are here to stay for now. I might change my mind, of course, if I happen to read a million things again in a month. But for now, I think this is the way to go. I'm going to talk you through what I read in May, starting from least favorite to favorite, as always. And the thing I liked the least in the month wasn't because it was bad. It mostly comes at the bottom of the list because of how forgettable it was. And that is Force of Nature by Jane Harper. I read The Dry a month or two ago on audio and really enjoyed Enjoyed it. The Dry is the first in the Aaron Fox series, which is an Australian mystery series that I really enjoyed. But the things I liked about The Dry the most were not present in Force of Nature, because I'm a sucker for a person who is estranged from their hometown, forcing to go back and having to come to terms with things. And when it's re done really well, the tension and the weirdness of like these weird neglected relationships, I, I love. And I think that that was really done well in, in The Dry. And then of course it was thrown in with the murder mystery that, well, not utterly unpredictable was still compelling enough to keep me listening. But unfortunately, Force of Nature didn't have that same element because it wasn't focused in Aaron Falk's hometown. And part of this is because Aaron Falk isn't a murder detective. So he was working investigating a company that was probably doing something dubious and illegal. So they had basically a mole in the company reporting on what the goings on, and she was trying to get information about the company to them, uh, to Falk and his partner for this investigation. However, this woman that was acting as the mole went on a team building trip with some of her coworkers and it was a hiking trip. So they were um, kind of thrown off into the bush and forced to figure out how to survive. They were of course given some provisions, but it was a team building exercise to use a map and a compass and be able to set up a camp and, and make it through the three days on this trail. Um, but things go poorly and Aaron Falk is called in when, you know, the men who go on this same trail come back just fine, but the women have to be rescued and one of them is missing. And so from there, you follow the investigation in real time, but you also flash back to what happened to the women on this trip over the course of the three days and how things got so awry and what really happened. So it's it's more much more of a missing person's case. And of course, you're piecing together all of the, the things that were going on with Falk and his investigation, as well as these women in this company. And there are a lot more layers than you'd expect, of course. Um, but for me, the women in the group were characterized very um, unevenly. And to me, that made it really clear who should be suspect. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more than that, but I feel like they were really uneven. And I don't think the audiobook was the best way to consume this story as I did because the narrator is great. He's the same as the first narrator. He does very little to differentiate the women in this group. And I think that there are five or six of them. And it took me several hours of listening to really figure out who was who because they were not given a lot of description, which also could be a failing on James Harper's part. But had the narrator done anything to differentiate these women's voices, it might have been easier to tell them apart. Um, so it took me a very long time to find my footing in that half of the story and to really care. And the ultimate revelations at the end of the book lacked surprise. So it was a totally fine book, but it's no ton of French and it's no Robert Galbraith. So I might read more of the Aaron Falk novels as they come out to fill the gap that ton of French and Robert Galbraith slash JK Rowling leave, because I think those mysteries are much more well drawn, much more character rich, and just much more 
compelling in general. So they're all things that I enjoy listening to on audio and I will probably carry on with it, but these are really unremarkable and I honestly had kind of forgotten that I listened to it by the end of the month, which is not great. Um, so I wouldn't highly recommend these, but if you were a big fan of the dry and you want more of that, I guess this does deliver to some extent, but it didn't contain what I liked about the dry, um, which obviously it can't because of the nature of the story of the dry, but I found that to be a much better constructed story in general, more compelling, better mystery, all that stuff. And this also might seem like it's coming low on this list, but I just read some pretty compelling things. So next I want to briefly talk about Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Not because I don't like Harry Potter, I still do, but I think that um, this most recent read of Chamber of Secrets has illuminated to me just how weak this novel is. Because I've for a long time been a staunch defender of Chamber of Secrets as not as bad as everyone thinks it is, because I know it often is people's least favorite or near the bottom. And I guess I would tend to agree with that now. I think I defended it for a long time, honestly, because it was an underdog, but it also does contain some elements that I really, really love that I think are often forgotten about. Like N Nearly Headless Nick's Death Day Party, which I adore. And just the whole revelation of Harry speaking parcel tongue and not knowing who the heir of Slytherin is and the mystery of it in the diary. These are all things that I just really love, but yes, narratively, it is weaker. It also does suffer from having to repeat a lot of what was said in The Sorcerer's Stone, which I understand you have to do for a children's story, but this really stuck out to me because my mom did read this aloud to me when I was a child, but that was in like 1998 or whatever year this came out. So I'm a touch more analytical than I was in 1998 when I was five years old. So the repetition of Harry being a wizard and establishing what Hogwarts is and who Ron and Hermione are and who all the professors are and, and what magic is and his relationship to it, that was a little bit grating as well. And I think that that fades away a bit as um, J.K. Rowling gains more confidence in her reader's ability to remember stuff. And so I can kind of understand it, but it is hard to forgive because it was very repetitive at the beginning. It's a little bit weaker, but the drawings and the illustrations still add so much to it, and that was delightful as well. So it's got some gems like this, like this is Diagon Alley, which is fabulous. Um, and it actually is a continuation of the original Diagon Alley from the first book, which I thought was really cool. And you know, you get to see the burrow for the first time, which obviously is super special and nice. Um, and Overall, yeah, it was a really fun experience, but I do think it is weaker than Sorcerer's Stone. Next, I have some nonfiction to talk about. This I also listened to on audio, and it was at the recommendation of Vanessa over at Split Reads. She talked about this on her channel a little while ago, uh, and it was A False Report, A True Story of Rape in America by Ken Armstrong and T. Christian Miller. And this is a piece of true crime journalism that is about a series of serial rapes that happened not actually that far from where I live, which is not a thing that I realized going in. So it was very intriguing to hear Golden and Boulder and Aurora, all these towns near where I live in Denver, described. And in a, I guess in a way made it seem much more real to me and more visceral because it was so close to where I lived in places that I lived when these things were happening. So this is about some serial rapes that were happening and is all kind of tied into the idea that one, the, one of the first people to report this was not believed. And she was eventually coerced by the police into confessing to false reporting and, and tried it for it. And the reporters also tie together not only the crimes themselves, but the investigation that led to the eventual capture of the criminal. And they also tie in some of his backstory as well and his perspective and what he was thinking and, and what was motivating him to do these, these awful things. And it, it definitely does work to emphasize the two female detectives that really brought to light these crimes and brought the, the victim's justice, which I thought was fantastic. And I think that they also write from a place of knowing that they're like two white dudes writing about rape. Um, and they tried to not sensationalize the crimes too much, but, but they also felt it important to include enough detail to really bring to light what happened to the victims without disrespecting them in any kind of way. So overall, it was it was a piece of, of true crime reporting that I've never seen before, because I think mostly what I'm exposed to in terms of true crime is uh, murder rather than sexual assault and violent, sexual violence, but still difficult to listen to just for different reasons, because the survivors survive and, um, they do go into detail about what happens, but enough that it's, it's visceral and, and could be triggering, of course, because of the nature of the crime. It did bring a lot of really important issues to light. For instance, why we as a society are so 
quick to think that women are lying about being assaulted um, and, and kind of like the historical precedent for that and how steeped in the patriarchy and misogyny it is, of course, the way, in the way that judges and lawmakers have made it way easier for us to suspect women of lying. There isn't a lot of research done into false reporting and how prevalent it actually is. And people, I think, assume it's a lot more prevalent than it is, but the best numbers we have say it's like 2% of all reported rapes. And, you know, way more rapes go unreported than reported. So it's this whole big problem. And, and it also brings up the issue of like how many untested rape kits there are in the world and like how awful that is. But it also explains like how rape kits were even invented and like, how much work it took for women to actually even get that legitimized. So I think it's a really well-rounded piece of reporting and I got a lot out of it. I think I would have gotten more out of it had I read it in print and was able to annotate and note, but it was good audiobook material if you like to listen to that sort of thing. Next is one I only want to mention briefly because I did do a full review and that is Swamplandia by Karen Russell, a novel that was on my shelf for years. I was inspired to read this because I've been doing a try a chapter tag thing where I try to knock books off of my physical TBR, um, decide whether or not I want to hold on to them, and it also just happened to point me to my next read. And the second iteration that I did that actually did the same thing. So I've been finding it very productive to both cull my shelves to things I'm no longer interested in, but it also helps to point me toward things that I've owned for a really long time and maybe don't remember why I wanted them, but has uh, served to like pique my interest and really push me over the edge into actually reading them. My brief thoughts and like quick review is, this is a story about the Big Tree family and they own a gator park on a tiny little island off the coast of Florida. Um, so they make gators an attraction. And the biggest attraction is that the mother of the family is a gator wrestler, but she dies of cancer. So the family is both grieving her loss, but also dealing with not having any business in their park because they've lost their main attraction. Um, so it's both them processing the grief and then trying to move forward and pick up the pieces. But each of the three big tree children and the father process both of these events um, in different ways. And to me, it's like a very character focused story because you need to explore these characters to varying degrees through the ways that they cope. It does have some flaws. It's not the perfect novel, but overall I really did enjoy reading it and would definitely recommend it. Another audiobook that I listened to this month was The Recovering by Leslie Jameson. I have not read The Empathy Exams, but I know that that received some like mixed reception. The conceit behind The Recovering appealed to me much more because for whatever reason, I am very fascinated by addiction and recovery narratives. But this one is a little bit different because this is a combination of Leslie Jameson's memoir about her addiction and then subsequent recovery. But it also weaves together kind of the cultural history of alcoholism, mostly starting from like the early 20th century to the present. And the way that alcoholism is treated both in, by society at large, but also how it has been treated differently based on famous artists that were also alcoholics and the way that they represented their addiction through their work. And how this definitely varied based on gender, the way that um, male alcoholics like Hemingway were glorified versus the way that female alcoholics like Jean Reese were kind of condemned for their behavior. She also goes into things like the science behind addiction, the war on drugs and how racially biased that was, the way that treatment and, and conviction have affected addiction and recovery over time. And then there's a really, really big focus also on Alcoholics Anonymous and the, the birth of that as a recovery movement and sort of how it grew and changed over time. Um, and Leslie Jameson tries to weave these different pieces of cultural history into her own narrative with varying levels of success, I think. Uh, I was much more drawn to her, her personal narrative um, in her own memoir. So she describes being a young writer and the way that alcoholism affected her relationships, mostly her romantic ones, but also how it affected her relationship to her writing and her work um, and her visions of success and how she viewed her own successes. But to me, it felt very uneven because she does get into a lot of detail about a lot of the mistakes that she made and, and like some nitty gritty details about her addiction, but I also felt very removed from her own processes in association with her work. And there seems to be a lack of self-awareness at times, mostly in terms of her own privilege um, and how she's able to do all these things because she glosses over a lot of things like, oh yeah, I just happened to get into the Iowa Writers Workshop. And she kind of writes it off like, well, I didn't get into any other writing programs that I applied to, but you got into Iowa. Like that's the big one, that's huge. Or the fact that she gets a lot of fellowships um, to travel and write and, and work um, and she, talks about the ways that she abused these privileges w with substance abuse. And, and she tells stories about like traveling and drinking on like a, a fellowship or a scholarship or something, but she doesn't explain how she got those things, which to me is like 
almost humble braggy. Like I was able to do all of these things, but like, it's not actually that big of a deal. Let's focus on all the shitty things I did. I feel like it would have felt more grounded and more real and more introspective had she also addressed all of this success that she was having um, and really talked in about like how she got those things as well. I feel like that was a big part that was missing. Like she just happened to have all of these, all of these um, opportunities that she took advantage of, but they were kind of thrown in there as, as set dressing. And, and to me, it felt like it lacked a lot of self-awareness for those reasons. And the other big flaw of this is the cultural history parts that she tries to integrate into her own narrative because some of them are really effective. Like the history of AA, she starts talking about AA when she discovers AA and starts going to meetings herself. And I thought that having that history and that context actually did really improve the narrative and gave me new things to think about. Context that I didn't previously have and it helped really helped her story. But other parts about like the war on drugs or throwing in aspects about the science of addiction and the actual chemicals and chemical reactions that your brain has to addiction did feel kind of thrown in. And the bits where she focuses on certain authors I felt like were overly long because this is a 16 hour audiobook. It's over 500 pages in print. So to me, it really feels like two books that she wanted to write that she kind of mushed together into one. And she kind of, you know, really tried to press them together and make them stick. They stuck really well together in some places and not so much in others. And so while I can appreciate what she's doing because she wrote this series of essays in the hopes that she could tell as compelling a recovery narrative as, as um, some addiction narratives are, we as humans are fascinated by disaster and people's lives falling apart. But when they pick up the pieces, it's less engaging. She was hoping to kind of subvert that and make a really compelling recovery story. And I think overall it was pretty successful. This is one of the best things I read this month, I think. Um, and I got a lot out of it and I really wanted to keep listening, which I think is always indicative of a really strong audiobook, which she does read herself, by the way. Um, but there were just other things about it that didn't work so well. This is not a perfect book and it was definitely too long. It could have been cut a lot. And if it had been like two 200 page books, I think it would have been much more successful had they been separate. Um, but I understand her reasoning behind putting them together. I just don't know if it worked as well as she hoped it would have. And speaking of flawed, that brings us to the last two books I want to talk about. Um, so these are definitely not perfect. I didn't have any five star reads in May, which is a little bit of a bummer, but I still got a lot out of what I was reading. And I think that that's all that really matters. But I have two books to kind of talk about in the top spot. First being Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb and second being Royal Assassin. I liked Assassin's Apprentice much more, but I felt like we should just talk about them in the same part of the video just because their books one and two in a series. In case you're unaware, Assassin's Apprentice and Royal Assassin are the first two books in the Farseer trilogy by Robin Hobb, which is an epic fantasy trilogy that takes place in a much bigger series called the Realm of the Elderlings series. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. The Farseer trilogy in general focuses on a character named Fitz. Assassin's Apprentice opens when Fitz is a young boy and he is brought to the capital of this large kingdom called Buckkeep. Um, and he is kind of dumped on the steps. This is the bastard son of the king in waiting. So we don't want him anymore. Good luck. And so the discovery that the like heir to the throne has a bastard kind of throws off everything politically. And Fitz is, is left in the kingdom with no family, no one to care for him. The knowledge of his existence is the catalyst for a bunch of political happenings throughout the books. So the first novel largely chronicles his upbringing in the castle as a young boy, and no one really knows what to do with him exactly. And they end up deciding to train him as a assassin. Um, he's gonna be the king's assassin, basically. And it goes from there. Obviously, I can't go into more details because there are a lot of twists and turns. For me, the strengths of these novels are the characters and the world. I got a pretty good sense for the world. I felt like the world building was very effective. I'm very intrigued by the world and all the political goings on. And the characters are also very well drawn. I feel like I got to know a lot of them really well. When bad things happened to people, I cared a lot. I was very invested emotionally. Um, and I think that the trajectory of the plot did have a lot of good twists and surprises that I didn't necessarily see, see coming, which I always love. The biggest flaw for me is that this is certainly too long. This is 200 pages longer than Assassin's Apprentice, but could have probably been about the same length as Assassin's Apprentice, honestly. There's a lot of descriptions of eating, not even descriptions of food, but descriptions of like going to the kitchen and getting food and having a little chat with the cook and then bringing the food back up to the bedroom and then eating the food and then going to sleep. Like that, there's a lot of that. That can all be cut. And there are also too many sex scenes, like I get it. And, and those could also have been cut. So it's little bits like that that don't provide anything to either the world or my understanding of the characters or the story, and those can all go. Because a little bit of that is fine. It adds 
some intrigue, it adds some world building, it adds some atmosphere. But a lot of that is just like, oh my God, when are we getting to the fireworks factory? So my feelings of these are mixed for sure. Uh, like this is definitely too long. And Assassin's Quest, which is the third book in this series, is 200 pages longer than this one, which I cannot even imagine being necessary. And from what I've heard, it's not. I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed both of these novels because I had read Assassin's Apprentice before and I thought that it was fine, but it hadn't knocked my socks off. But there was something really immersive and cozy feeling about the first one like bad things happen so it's not like super cozy but i just loved the feeling of it so much and i felt very connected to it in a way that i hadn't felt before so those are all the things that i read in the month of may of course i would love to hear your thoughts on any of the things that i read if you happen to have read them too and other than that thank you all so much for watching and i will see you next time